Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a reach for me, I think. Um, but I think uh, we should just get started. Uh, my name is Evan Wood. I'm a professor of medicine at UBC and one of the founders of Stop the Violence BC. And essentially, I've been tasked with giving a little bit of background about the Stop the Violence BC Coalition for about two minutes. Uh, and then I'll set a bit of an agenda for this morning. So I think as everybody knows, British Columbia has been dealing with major issues related to organized crime and gang violence as a result of the marijuana industry. And although uh, police have been acknowledging this, your average British Columbian, and Canadian for that matter, doesn't really know that all the grow ops and all the organized crime concerns are really a direct result of marijuana prohibition. So that's where Stop the Violence BC comes in. We are a coalition of experts that is engaging in a public education campaign with three key um, issues that we're trying to bring forward. The first is that marijuana prohibition has not achieved its stated objectives. Uh, for people that doubt that, you can look at the government's own data, which shows that young people have easier access to marijuana than alcohol and tobacco. Um, if you still don't believe that, I encourage you on Friday to go to the art gallery for the annual 420 event, where I think this reality uh, should be clear to everybody. We're also talking about the unintended consequences of prohibition. Um, uh, obviously, I've alluded to some of those. All of the harms related to the marijuana industry are an expected and natural consequence of our current laws and policies. And the last thing that we're talking about is the value of a regulated and taxed market for adult marijuana use. And with any coalition, it's, it's an interesting group that's come together. Just uh, a week or two ago, it was the Chief Medical Health Officer, Perry Kendall, who came out in support of taxation and regulation of marijuana. He was simply joining the vast number of individuals from public health and medicine who have said exactly the same thing, including the Health Officers Council of British Columbia. We, of course, have been joined by individuals from law enforcement, uh, and today we have someone who will be speaking to us who is operating at the very highest level of uh, drug law enforcement in the United States. And of course on this side of the border we have former prosecutors, former Supreme Court justices, uh, former and current members of law enforcement who have all been saying exactly the same thing. And of course when you have a, a broad coalition like this, uh, it obviously creates interesting bedfellows. And of course we're being joined by individuals from the community who for many years have been saying exactly the same thing. So with that background uh, in mind, um, uh, I'll, I'll just set the agenda for how things are going to go this morning. Uh, first, uh, I'll be um, leaving the podium for uh, Jeff Plant. I think everybody in the room knows that Jeff Plant was uh, MLA for uh, the better part of 10 years in this province. Uh, from 2001 to 2005, he was Attorney General in this province. He's one of the four famous attorney generals who uh, came out in support of uh, Stop the Violence BC. Uh, Jeff will introduce John. Uh, John will speak for approximately 20 minutes. And then at that time, um, we're going to ask members of the public that have assembled to please leave the room so we can start with the press conference. The press conference will be approximately 10 to 15 minutes uh, with Jeff, John, and myself. Uh, and then Jody Emery will come and join us for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. So with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll turn things over to Jeff. Thanks, Evan, and uh, thanks to everyone for uh, being here this morning. Uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be on this uh, platform uh, today. Um, the, uh, as someone who was the chief law officer of the government of British Columbia, I know that when we uh, think of using law enforcement as a tool uh, we usually think that it's going to make a problem go away. When we're talking about cannabis, the effect of law enforcement is to make the problem worse in almost every respect. And for the last few weeks since I was privileged to join with three other former attorneys general in a, a call for taxation and regulation, I've had lots of conversations with people uh, and, and really lots and lots of support. One question that gets asked from time to time is, what could we do in Canada, given what is happening south of the border in the United States? And I think that there is a, an impression that Canadians often have 
that we would be at risk if we attempted to uh, make our law more progressive vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, what's happening south of the border. Uh, that's particularly why I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to hear from uh, a law enforcement official from the United States who's, who's going to tell us that that's not necessarily so and who's going to make the strong case why we all have to join together to change a failed public policy approach and move towards the regulation and taxation approach. John McKay is a former United States attorney for the District of Western Washington. Uh, we actually met, I'm sure, about a decade ago in the uh, aftermath of 9-11 when the governments on both sides of the border were working hard to deal with cross-border terrorism risks. And indeed now, uh, these days, he's a professor of constitutional law in terrorism uh, at the Seattle University School of Law. Um, he has a long history of public service working uh, as a White House fellow working as a special assistant to the director of the FBI, a very distinguished career as a United States attorney. Uh, in 1995, he was named uh, the Pro Bono Lawyer of the Year by the Washington State Bar Association. He received the uh, Association's Award of Merit, which is the highest honor that that association can give, and in 2007 um, received the Courageous Award. So he is a uh, much honored and uh, I think a very articulate and enormously persuasive uh, official on this important issue, which he has now uh, joined uh, his voice to, particularly in relation to initiatives uh, in Washington State. So I'm just delighted to now welcome uh, John McCain to the podium. Jeff, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Very kind introduction. Uh, I am John McKay. I'm uh, currently a law professor in Seattle at Seattle University, but I spent uh, more than five years as the United States Attorney in Seattle. Uh, in our system in the United States, the United States Attorney serves as the chief federal law enforcement official for their district. Uh, among those duties, as Jeff pointed out, were counterterrorism, counterintelligence, uh, international and interstate crime. And key to that, um, international uh, cross-border drug crime, to include marijuana prosecutions. And so I'm uh, very pleased to be here today to discuss my support as a private citizen now for uh, the regulation and taxation of marijuana as a much better answer to the enormous threat uh, facing citizens of both Canada and the United States um, because of our failed policies on marijuana. And I want to say this just as clearly and as forthrightly as I can, marijuana prohibition, criminal prohibition of marijuana, is a complete failure. It's a failure in the United States. I would respectfully offer that it is a failure here in Canada as well, and that the problem uh, posed by the vast marijuana black market, criminal marijuana black market, is a threat to public safety both in the United States and in Canada. I think it's time to rethink our criminalization policy and prohibition policy on marijuana. We know this through scores and scores of prosecutions. We know this through uh, many uh, individuals who have been incarcerated and placed in jail. We know this because there are millions of Canadians and millions of Americans who regularly smoke marijuana uh, in the face of criminal penalties. So we know absolutely and completely that marijuana prohibition is a failure. And it's time for our legislators on both sides of the border, in the United States Congress, in the parliaments in Canada, uh, nationally and, and provincially, uh, in the legislatures, including in my home state, the state of Washington, to uh, rethink these, these failed policies. I currently sponsor an initiative, along with others in the state of Washington, called Initiative 502. Uh, this would be a change in the state's policy on marijuana. Both the state and federal government uh, currently uh, make the possession of any amount of marijuana illegal, with the exception under state law in Washington for medical use of marijuana. And I'll come back to medical use in, in just a moment. Uh, but it's clear that any citizen in the United States, whether uh, possessing a, a prescription of some kind for marijuana or not, is susceptible to being arrested by federal authorities, those of whom, whom I oversaw in my duties as United States Attorney. So we have the untenable situation in the state of Washington, just south of here, 
uh, where it is simultaneously legal and illegal to possess or use marijuana for certain persons. And I would suggest this is a failure, a further evidence of failure of our policies. Government's a failure when it simultaneously is telling its citizens something is legal and illegal. And it, and it certainly is a call that our, our policy-making bodies reform their own approach to, uh, to marijuana. I'm going to come back to what I see as the threat. I want to just sketch out quickly what I-502 does just south of the border. Uh, I think it's very innovative. We will see it on our ballot. 502 would regulate and tax marijuana. It would make it legal to possess for adults an ounce or less of marijuana at any particular time. It would be regulated at every point of its production, its sale, its taxation, its content, and then the use of the proceeds. And the proceeds, which I think will be very significant, our estimates uh, go range as high as, as uh, half a billion dollars would be raised in tax revenues uh, in, um, in a fully taxable year under 502. And those proceeds would be earmarked under, under our initiative to, that, that has been submitted to the people for use in public health uh, models rather than law enforcement models. This would include education. It would include treatment. It would, it would continue to make sure that we make it illegal to sell and distribute to juveniles, to minors. Uh, it would continue to be illegal to drive while intoxicated by marijuana, be illegal to, to, to pilot boats or to, to use heavy machinery while using marijuana. <clears throat> Excuse me. So all of these things continue under the, the current regime. Uh, why, why does the policy need to change? The policy needs to change because we have failed, as I've indicated, uh, and we are, through our policies, promoting a huge black market with billions of dollars that are being exploited by criminal uh, cartels, by gangs, organized crime on both sides of the border. I want to give you just a few examples of cases that were, were prosecuted, and then I want to talk for a moment about the case of Mark Emery, uh, whom I authorized, whose arrest I authorized, uh, whose prosecution I helped commence before a federal grand jury in Seattle, and as many of you know, he continues to serve time in a federal prison uh, in the United States. If you were to look at the leading criminal prosecutions federally, which is our, our, our I would su suggest, our highest level of prosecution in the United States, and you just perused the list of individuals who have been arrested, you will see Canadian after Canadian after Canadian, arrested in the United States, prosecuted in the United States, incarcerated in the United States. And I want to give you a, a couple of examples. The most recent posting you will find if you look at the United States Attorney's Office uh, press room is March 30th, 2012, and it's a Canadian. Uh, a Canadian who helped coordinate an elaborate cocaine tra trafficking and transportation scheme Involving the Sinaloa cartel, one of the largest and most dangerous Mexican drug cartels, this individual was, was uh, arrested and convicted for smuggling cocaine north to Canada and in exchange for marijuana coming south from British Columbia. So under the economic scheme which is developed under this illegal uh, marijuana market, we see vast marijuana production here in lower British Columbia. We see it transported illegally across the border despite enormous U.S. resources uh, which are attempting to prevent just that thing from occurring. Billions of dollars worth of marijuana going essentially right down the I-5 corridor, but that's being exchanged for something. It's not just money, it's guns and it's cocaine and other drugs going back and forth across the border, but that's the basic exchange. And so you saw in this particular uh, prosecution uh, of Mr. Mario Joseph Fenianos, a Canadian uh, who lived in Los Angeles. Uh, he was responsible for receiving the cocaine, which was going to make its way back up north here to Canada in exchange for BC Bud marijuana in California. Not many people know of or think about this connection between the growth of massive amounts of, of marijuana grown here in British Columbia and direct exchange with violent, despicable drug cartels in Mexico, and the link is, is very, very clear to us who are, who are in law enforcement. Um, uh, cocaine and methamphetamine production uh, principally occurring or originating in Mexico, 
distributed, distributes the, the uh, marijuana that is shipped to Southern California. The cocaine then uh, comes back up. In February also of this year, um, a, a, a Mr. Yim, a, a Canadian citizen, uh, also was, was uh, arrested and then convicted for shipping 19 kilos of can cocaine from Southern California to Canada, again, in exchange for uh, agreements to distribute BC bud marijuana in Southern uh, California. And Southern California is a distribution point. It's also a point of great consumption for uh, BC bud, which is obviously grown here. Uh, March 25th, I wanted to highlight this case, Mar March 25th of 2011, so just a year ago, seven Canadian uh, members of the Hells Angels. So the Hells Angels, uh, it's no secret, uh, massively involved here in the uh, collection of the marijuana that's grown here and its distribution south across the border. They, along with Asian gangs here, are typically responsible for the harvesting, the collection, the distribution, and of course the payment to those who would engage in uh, the manufacture or growing of, of marijuana here. Seven uh, arrested uh, and convicted in the United States, all residents of British Columbia. Some were dual citizens. Uh, they were sentenced uh, to 20 years in prison because of the amounts of marijuana involved. Many times the marijuana will go south and the deal for cocaine is done through another connection uh, such as the one that I just mentioned uh, to you a moment ago. Uh, February 15, 2011, Clay Franklin Roche, of Vancouver, uh, sentenced in U.S. District Court to 30 years in prison. Uh, conspiracy to export cocaine, cocaine coming this way, to import marijuana, marijuana coming this way. So you see in Mr. Roche, and I've got uh, more of these, I won't, I won't bore you by reading all the details, but I, if you just take the press releases being issued by the United States Attorney's Office, through whom the Drug Enforcement Administration and the FBI coordinate all of their activities, the principal uh, face you will see of it is the arrest of individuals either working with or for Canadian gangs and uh, uh, marijuana, illegal marijuana uh, manufacturers and distributors or connecting to Mexican drug cartels in Southern California. This is an, an enormously potent and dangerous uh, environment which um, it is only fair to say is created and maintained by our failed criminal marijuana prohibition. Law enforcement, through tremendous effort, highly skilled, well-trained, well-financed, knows that they are only getting the smallest, smallest percentage of the commodity. The fewer, fewer numbers of individuals who are actually involved in this activity and, and a teeny amount of the, the very dangerous uh, Canadian and U.S. dollars that are uh, associated with this with this campaign. And what happens to those dollars? I would suggest to you that that the the fact that Mexican drug cartels, uh, uh, dangerous gangs operating both in the United States and in Canada, are all profiting from the black market that is created by our failed policy. So if you strategically look at the question of what do we do about the violence that's being spawned here, the pits that are uncovered with uh, headless bodies thrown in, it, it's because they are servicing the demand for drugs, beginning with marijuana, uh, moving all the way through to cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin, driven principally, I believe, by the, the huge, huge dollars that are tied to marijuana, not to the cocaine, to the meth and the heroin, but to the marijuana. Uh, the United States uh, analysts have, have indicated that as much as 60% of the income of Mexican drug cartels, for example, comes from the presence and existence of the American marijuana demand. Huge demand for marijuana. So the, the, uh, it's not, I don't think it's important for us to cast blame uh, on, on who would be responsible, whether it would be the production of marijuana in lower British Columbia or the demand for marijuana in Southern California, to use, to use two examples. The fact is, that prohibition, criminal prohibition, going back 75 years, has never been successful in stopping the demand for marijuana. And so individuals have made their choices. The individual consumer, if you will, has determined that they will smoke and use marijuana. That has not changed despite the fact that we threaten to incarcerate people. 10,000 people per year are arrested and jailed in the state of Washington alone, and nearly a million across the United States for simple marijuana possession. Um, 
that alone should provoke a lot of discussion and debate as to whether that is the way that we would want to deal with the health issues involved in consuming marijuana. I'm a law enforcement person. I'm not a health person like Evan, uh, Dr. Wood is here, but uh, I certainly question whether the threat posed by marijuana as a health concern merits uh, a criminal penalty for its use. It seems much more likely and much more beneficial to treat it as a health issue, to let families deal with it, and to put, take law enforcement and apply it against those who are using the guns, who are using the violence, who are using it to create dangerous narcotics, uh, and to pursue them and force them out of the market. And what will replace them? Legal enterprises licensed by the state, in, in, if, if I-502 were to pass in the state of Washington, and a similar scheme, I think, which could be advanced here, as, as uh, Jeff Plant has suggested, might be the future here, regulation and taxation. I have just a few more comments, and I want to I want to just address a question uh, uh, first uh, to, to discuss. Uh, I, I think I'll, I, I will address the Mark Emery situation. Let me just tell you that I have uh, met Jody Emery. She, I know, is going to join us in a few, in a few moments. Uh, she's a lovely person. Uh, I, I have to say that, that I have no regrets uh, in terms of my prosecution of Mark Emery. Uh, uh, Mr. Emery chose to change uh, his uh, policies, marijuana policies here, by breaking them rather than advocating for change. I think that was a, a tremendous mistake. Uh, his decision and choice was to uh, uh, sell marijuana seeds, which we consider to be marijuana, in the United States to any individual who, who, who wanted to purchase them. Uh, so we're in disagreement on what was the correct thing to do if, if that was Mr. Emery's purpose to change policy. I think he chose the wrong path. Um, we do share, I think, uh, a belief that the underlying policies are wrong and the choices and how we address them uh, are individual choices. Mine is to now that I'm free to advocate for changes in policy. I'm no longer responsible for implementing them. As a person responsible for implementing the law, it's my sworn duty to do just that. But uh, when not in that position, and as a person who is knowledgeable of the facts underlying our failure in, in marijuana prohibition, I am free now to speak out against it. And I know few have done so. I think it takes uh, courage for someone like uh, Jeff to step forward and to say our policies uh, should be changed. And I'm hoping that more will step forward and do that. Uh, I know there is some concern that, that perhaps uh, Canada might be moving too quickly that maybe if Canada were to, or British Columbia were to look at regulation and taxation that would somehow merit a negative response from the United States. I don't think that is at all the case. In fact, I think given what's happening in the state of Washington, a similar movement in the state of Colorado to regulate tax and legalize marijuana for adults in possession of small amounts, Decriminalization in 14 states in the United States, medical marijuana in 16 states in the District of Columbia. I hardly think that uh, a rethinking of marijuana laws on the south of the border, on the United States side of the border, um, will somehow uh, discourage or should discourage policymakers here from considering that. There's been talk that somehow there would be retaliation by the United States if there were a regulation and taxation scheme here. Hardly. The same debate, perhaps further along, is occurring south of the border. So I, I, I look forward to, to uh, questions here from, uh, from the media, but I wanted to uh, just finish by saying, you know, I think, I, I do think, uh, I, I don't want to sort of try to stand up here and assume any sort of moral high ground, but I, I think it's really important that when societies choose to criminalize behavior, we have broad agreement and support in the community that that behavior is, is criminal. We don't have that anymore in the state of Washington. I don't think we have it in the United States. I don't think there is broad agreement that uh, persons with guns and badges, judges with authority, jailers with jails uh, and prisons should be utilized for this behavior. I don't think we have broad community agreement on that anymore. And I think every criminal law that we have where someone's liberty is at stake, that should be a prerequisite. I'm not suggesting that we poll uh, on our criminal laws, but I think that we as a community in the broadest, deepest sense of what a community is, should say that we have community agreement on this. And I would suggest to you that there is no one who could stand in front of you and say that communities broadly continue to support the criminalization of this activity. And so my simple question 
to policymakers on both sides of the borders is why haven't you rethought this? So I think it's time to ask that question and to politely, respectfully, but firmly advance it as people who care about public safety, who care about dramatic and horrible gun violence, who care about what billions of dollars of proceeds handed over to criminals can and is doing, and it is time for change. And I, I want to state my deepest admiration for uh, Dr. Evan Wood for Stop the Violence BC, for the dialogue that they are encouraging. I'm proud to be associated with it. I really believe that this is a regional problem. It must have regional solutions. It requires cooperation, and, and that's why I'm here to help with this. And I will certainly appreciate and welcome and respect the same opinions and advice coming from our uh, Canadian sisters and brothers who are willing to engage in this issue. Thank you very much for having me here today. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much, John, for taking the time to come up here. Um, really appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to ask members of the public now to um, to please step out of the room, and we'll just um, very quickly set up for the press conference, and then uh, and then begin with that. So thank you again. So uh, this obviously isn't my day job, but uh, I'll do my best to sort of uh, stick handle questions from uh, from the media. So uh, why don't we start here? Um, if, as you say, there really isn't that broad community support. What is it, or why is it, that the regulators uh, are not considering these voters? Well, I think they are considering uh, at, at some level. In the state of Washington, uh, we have an initiative process, so uh, we gathered uh, a couple hundred thousand or more signatures that brought it directly to the Washington State Legislature. Uh, they chose not to act on it, but under the provisions of our, of our process, it was then automatically referred uh, to people for a vote. So the legislature didn't act, but the people will in November. What about at a much higher level, a presidential level, a national leader level? Because this does come up at international conferences. I like to look at what happened in alcohol prohibition in the United States. We had a, a constitutional amendment to make alcohol illegal. We then had a repeal through another constitutional amendment in our history after we learned that alcohol prohibition was funding uh, mafia and violent gangs. If that sounds familiar, uh, it should. Um, I think uh, what, what we saw in alcohol prohibition historically in the United States was that it took states to begin to rebel against the, 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 the failed criminal prohibition of, of, of alcohol. And that's exactly what happened. States began to pass their own laws. I believe that's what will happen in the United States now, that it will take states to uh, be courageous and step forward, like Washington State, uh, like Colorado, I think California, Oregon, and others will follow, and w without doubt, we will attract the attention of, of the Congress and the federal government. Some of that might not be so good. How far along are the states on that road? Well, you, you know, if the, if the Washington, Washington vote will take place in a matter of months, if it passes, the state law of Washington State will have changed. And uh, it, there will be, it will be legal, as I've indicated, in small amounts for adults um, across the board in the state. The federal government can still enforce its criminal laws. And, and so there will, there will be, I think, a forced dialogue between the state and the federal government. I think it may well end up in a lawsuit. Uh, the federal government may choose to bring a, a lawsuit. My hope is that the federal government will begin a serious reevaluation of its failed policy. In the Canadian context, marijuana ban or not to ban is essentially a federal matter. But what, what do you want the province to do anyways? Uh, well, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, I think that the uh, status quo always has a huge amount of inertia attached to it, even when the status quo is a failed public policy. And so you've got to mobilize to, to create the inertia, to create the momentum for change. I think you can do that in a hotel ballroom in downtown Vancouver. You can do it by getting provincial governments gradually, uh, but I hope uh, inevitably, to align in support of this change. The change does require federal legislative change, in, in, in my view. Um, but the, the, the campaign, if you will, the momentum, can start in you know, the, the neighborhoods of, uh, of any city. Uh, and over time, I think uh, the momentum that is gathering from this campaign will, in fact, persuade federal policymakers uh, 
uh, that they are out of step with the community consensus of Canadians and that it's time for federal change. How is the Tory as a prefect so far? I think you have touched faith with the folks in the Tory. How is the Well, in, uh, the provincial government has uh, made the point publicly uh, and perhaps not surprisingly that this is a matter of federal law. Um, and so they deferred, if you will, to the federal government uh, for the policy leadership here. And that's their public view. I have private conversations with members of the legislature on both sides of the house who express uh, interest, who want to learn more, and also privately will uh, express uh, support. Um, so we're not at the point yet where a provincial, where our provincial government is willing or able to take the public leadership position, um, but we may get there, and uh, I, I think that uh, events like this and days like today are about building that momentum. Yeah, I, I would just add, you know, I've had a lot of private conversations with uh, elected officials in, in BC, and, and what people will say behind closed doors, and what's, uh, you know, been particularly exciting is it's really been the sort of uh, right of center fiscal conservatives um, who have really been the strongest supporters and cheerleaders behind the scenes. So I think it's just a matter of time and um, you know, we can't accept sort of deference to the federal government on this. The, the gang violence, the organized crime activity that's happening in this province uh, requires leadership um, at a provincial level, especially if we're getting um, you know, silence from, from the feds in terms of uh, doing something that, uh, that uh, will actually address these concerns. We address the elephant in the room here. Uh, marijuana is a major part of an even larger problem. There are many other drugs out there. Do we legalize and tax them or not? Can I can I try and try that from a Canadian perspective and then and then pass that on? Because in British Columbia we deal with these these issues and, and from a public health perspective, you know, the war on drugs hasn't worked with any of these drugs and it's contributed to health related harms. But in terms of the organized crime issues in BC. We're a cannabis producing region. We don't grow poppies, we don't grow coca leaves. We don't have a huge export market for those. And the domestic markets are tiny in comparison to marijuana. So we have a huge marijuana problem here. Um, and I think a simple solution to it that uh, would lead us moving from a violent unregulated market that benefits organized crime uh, to a strictly regulated market with public health and safety as its goals that would wage economic war on organized crime and move money towards uh, governments instead of, of gangsters. So um, I think lumping all these drugs together um, has been a huge mistake uh, and that we need to, to look at each one of these drugs individually in terms of the law enforcement and public health approaches that could be best applied to them to best protect public health and safety. So you can't say change it for them all, uh, but certainly for marijuana, I think the path forward from a, a, a public health and safety perspective is clear. There's still a common denominator, though, in terms of harm. Uh, wouldn't, uh, maybe, maybe not legalizing it, not taxing it, regulating it, but is there a, a similar solution for these other products that are in the market? Yeah, I, I want to give John and, and Jeff, if he wants to comment on this as well, a chance to speak. But just to give you a perspective, we already have a, a heroin prescription study happening in the downtown east side of Vancouver that looks absolutely nothing like what a, a tax and regulated market for marijuana would look like. Heroin is extremely dangerous. Organized crime benefits from its distribution. And Canada and a number of other countries are studying what an incredibly strict prescription model for intractable opiate addicts might look like. So, so again, I, I don't think they should be lumped together, but the issues with, uh, with organized crime benefiting from the illegality of these drugs, um, I think everyone would agree uh, there's, there's certainly parallels. I might just offer from the, from the US that I agree, agree with uh, uh, most of what uh, Evan just said. I, I think in the United States, the schedule of drug enforcement re is broken up into schedules one, two, three. Schedule one says, this applies to heroin, comma, marijuana. Marijuana is listed after marijuana in Schedule 1, our highest level of, of enforcement in the United States. Uh, I think if there's not a bright line, I think there's a pretty clear distinction between the pharmacological and physiological impacts of, of heroin and narcotic versus marijuana, which is not a, a narcotic. Uh, 
and I, I do think that we can draw that line. I think that if you were to look at the, the, the harmful effects of the proceeds that I've discussed, uh, they can be categorized with marijuana. So I think public health is always a worthy discussion around any uh, drug that's been criminalized. But I want to be clear that our proposal in Washington State relates only to marijuana. I do think that there is a bright line. I wouldn't rule out that discussion, but it's not my discussion. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, in my case, uh, there's uh, several answers to that question. So it's actually, it doesn't feel like it's been that long, but it's been almost a decade since I was the Attorney General of British Columbia. Um, and what I would say in that decade is that um, things are worse, and we should learn from experience and be prepared to change our perspective as we learn. Um, I think that the, uh, the spread and the proliferation of dangerous gang activity associated with the marijuana cross-border marijuana trade um, is a is a problem that is getting worse. What it was a problem ten years ago. Um, when you are in government, you have to make choices as a government, as a collective, about the policies that you collectively advocate. That's our system here in Canada, um, and that uh, the marijuana issue was not a priority for the government of British Columbia in the term when I was the Attorney General. So it was not really, there was not the opportunity to uh, advance it. Um, and uh, it, I, 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 that's the way it was then. Uh, I think that the landscape has changed. Um, and uh, frankly, in terms of why I'm doing this now, uh, it's because I'm actually honored to have been asked to contribute to this organization. Um, it was uh, the accident of an email or a phone call from Evan, who said, look, this, is, this movement is, is growing, it's gathering steam, would you be interested in adding your voice? And I said, well, I'm flattered to be asked, if you think I could make a difference, then I'm happy to try to do so. What about the argument some people may have that um, there's a lot of people right now that aren't smoking marijuana because it is illegal. If it's legalized, they'll start to smoke it, which could create a whole new set of problems. I mean, I, I, from my standpoint, I think, I think this is clear from the experience in, in Europe that there is, in most regimes where there, there is a decrim massive decriminalization or regulation of marijuana, a brief spike up in the use of marijuana, but that usually uh, moves back down. Uh, what we find is that people are going to smoke marijuana, whether it's legal or illegal, but most people would prefer to purchase their marijuana legally. So it's not a question of increased use, Jack, it's actually a question of where they're going to buy the marijuana and where the proceeds go to. I think a big concern is on youth consumption of marijuana. I don't have any doubt that, that, that every 14-year-old in Vancouver can find marijuana the same way every 14-year-old in Seattle can find marijuana. Uh, I would prefer to have that uh, uh, subject to a public health approach where uh, families and kids are educated about the potential addictive qualities of marijuana because they are. And they need to know about that, and, and I think discourage from its use, frankly, and let adults make their own decisions when they're properly informed. So I think that's the, the question. I would not expect a huge increase in marijuana based on experience in Europe. Mr. McKay, uh, I have a question. You mentioned your opinion of Mark Emery, and you said that you had no regrets uh, in prosecuting him because he broke the law. But since you now disagree with that law and think it's harmful, uh, is it? Shouldn't Emory really be regarded as a hero like others who have broken laws in the past to change things with civil disobedience like slavery, segregation, and alcohol prohibition? I'm not, I'm not in a position to morally judge Mark Emory. I mean, I had a simple function. Uh, I'm not going to tell you I didn't think about it. I did. Uh, I think my first prosecution as a young prosecutor in the United States was a marijuana possession charge. Frankly, I didn't give that one a lot of thought other than how to get the job done. I do think it's really important that we distinguish between those required to enforce the laws, who actually swear an oath to, to, to enforce the laws, that they go about their business in a way that, that, that they should. So no, I, I actually don't think he's a hero. I think that he should have uh, run for the parliament. Uh, I know he ran for mayor, I believe he ran for mayor. Uh, good on him for that. Uh, but I don't think choosing to violate the law in that way. I mean, he, he made a decision which would have allowed any juvenile to 
obtain marijuana in the United States. I think that's wrong. Right, but civil disobedience is a tactic, though. I don't think that's civil disobedience myself, but that's my opinion. You're entitled to yours. Uh, I don't agree. I, I wish Mark would have chosen another path. Uh, I wish he could have joined us up here, mm -hmm. as, as I understand, Joey, you will in a few moments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in Amsterdam, where they are considering sort of reversing in part their soft drug policy, um, there some of the people who are interested in closing off the cop shop tourists have said that uh, have gone a link that says that there are studies linking marijuana and mental marijuana use and mental illness. Can you explain whether that link is causal or spurious? Sure. Sure. And I think this reflects back on the comment about increased marijuana use under a taxation and regulation regime. So I think the key starting point, and this is where we really need policymakers to understand, is that marijuana is more freely and easily available to young people than alcohol and tobacco. I think many young people choose to use marijuana because of this forbidden fruit phenomenon that these laws have created, and that what we've seen with the strict regulation of things like tobacco is that we can actually drive down rates of use. So in the case of a possible link between marijuana and mental illness, that's all the more reason to regulate this so that we can apply a public health approach and look to address those possible issues. No one is talking about uh, you know, allowing advertisement and promotion and normalization of this activity. What we're talking about is applying what we know has driven down rates of tobacco and applying that science, and it's a very vast science, to try and reduce rates of use rather driving kids to the margins where these types of harms can occur, like uh, the possible link with mental illness, take a public health approach. Have you seen evidence one way or the other to suggest whether one causes the other or it's the other way around? Do people use marijuana because they're mentally ill or does marijuana use cause mental Yeah, so I've reviewed this research because I'm the editor of the International Journal of Drug Policy, so I see these debates happening all the time. And the most striking thing is that if you look at rates of marijuana use internationally, you don't see a relationship to rates of things like schizophrenia. Can someone have acute intoxication on marijuana that looks like schizophrenia? I think they can. Um, but but you know, nobody from the Health Officers Council of British Columbia, of which I'm a member, is saying we should regulate marijuana because it's relatively safe in comparison to alcohol and tobacco. They're looking at heroin and these other things and saying the more dangerous, the more reason there is to regulate. So in the case of a possible link between marijuana and mental illness, that fits perfectly with that argument. <coughs> Ian, I wonder if, um, okay. Many other inmates in prison with him 
are pleased to know that there is a lot of reform going on outside of prison to try and save people's lives um, in terms of ending prohibition and changing our drug laws. I see some media is starting to trickle out with uh, trying to get things uh, get things up. I'm, I'm happy to take you know a few more questions. Otherwise, I know Ian has the press release and. Um, some other materials to take with you. Yeah. I just had a question for Professor McKay. You, you alluded to the connection between a violent in Mexico and the pot here in this province. I think that's something that maybe some people don't think about it. And is there a way to quantify that or sort of establish that in fact? We hear about that anecdotally. There's a connection between the throw up here and headless bodies and pits in Mexico. But how do we know that? Yeah, I think you know. I think any any person who uh, you know engages in in this activity uh, has to feel some responsibility. I feel responsibility as a as a as an American citizen for the fact that demand in the United States fuels production in British Columbia, which then is distributed uh, in Southern California and along the Southwest border uh, through Mexican uh, uh, drug cartels. So gangs affiliated with dangerous drug cartels are distributing marijuana grown in British Columbia. It's being exchanged for guns and cocaine to come up here. So the, the, the negative impact of that is more than just the proceeds going to Mexican drug cartels uh, at some level, but, but also what's coming back to Canada because of this production. And, and it's, it is not a healthy uh, bounty, if you will, from, from that uh, production. So yeah, I think people need to see the direct connection, because I think it is a direct connection between production of some of the best pot in the world uh, and its sale and distribution to satisfy a ravenous American market for, uh, um, for marijuana and the proceeds of which are not being taxed, uh, the content of which is not being regulated and in fact these dollars are going to fund dangerous criminal gangs in Mexico, in the United States and I, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Wood pointed out pretty clearly here in Canada. Well, you know, I think on both sides of the border, uh, law enforcement, the, the border is an enforcement zone uh, and, and not a very good one, it turns out, because, uh, you know, in the United States, the, the joke is that if you see a Canadian with a hockey bag, that's probable cause for an arrest, that inside the hockey bag is going to be a lot of marijuana. Um, I'm sure the Canadian authorities feel the same way about cocaine and guns coming back across the border in exchange for, for marijuana. I think actually the, the, the international border at this point is a pretty helpful enforcement zone with regard to the, the guns, the cocaine, the meth, the ecstasy, and other drugs going back and forth. I would like to see, as I said in my remarks, a coordinated policy, uh, one in which these values are respected by both governments, which are independent, sovereign countries. They have to pass their own laws. But I, I hope that a recognition of the regional and, and uh, um, international consequences to include Mexico are huge and that requires coordinated policies where we mutually respect the roles of our legislatures and our Congress and our law enforcement officials so that we are all promoting public safety. Law enforcement is about public safety. That does not rule out public health. I think it includes public health. Let's choose the best approach to keep people safe in both of our countries and, and in Mexico as well. How much uh, momentum has uh, your organization gained since uh, more people have come on board, uh, especially guys in suits, in support? It's hard to quantify momentum, I think. Um, you know, we originally came forward with, uh, you know, current police, former police, former Supreme Court justices. Um, you know, that was a, a, a big news day that day and was followed up when the former mayors came on board. And then, of course, uh, you have to remember when the former attorney generals came on board and that was another big news day. What we really need to work on is the comments that are being made behind closed doors by politicians uh, to translate into a rational discussion, recognizing you know, the first issue, just the fact that marijuana is so freely and easily available um, is reason that politicians should change the policy. 
Um, the fact that it's costing tax dollars a huge amount of money and then also contributing to organized crime and gang violence is just totally unsustainable. But uh, the momentum, I, I think, will come when, when currently sitting politicians begin to uh, embrace this issue. Yeah, I think that uh, the work that uh, Evan and the coalition are doing is obviously it's about advocacy, it's about momentum building, but it's also about education. And it's about educating the public about this failure. And as we uh, get the opportunity to educate the public, we're educating voters, voters who will tell their members of parliament what to do. So uh, again, it's, it's impossible to quantify that kind of momentum. But I think those conversations are starting to take place. I, I, the level of interest that I've experienced in this conversation from, uh, from everyone that I talked to is really quite surprising uh, and gratifying and encouraging. So I choose to be an optimist. I think this is progress. I think we now have seen that um, the, the real future for this issue is cross-border conversations and education and policy reform. Um, and I think that's also within our grasp if we just keep that in the Will we ever see it in our lifetime? I, I believe so. Yes. I have plans for a long life, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but then I also have plans for the Canucks in 78. So, um, but the, no, I, you know, I, uh, I, I actually, uh, let me just restate, restate this. Um, I was genuinely surprised at the extent of the positive reaction of each step of this work that Dr. Wood and the coalition are doing, I think it is making a difference. Um, is it going to be within the term of office of the current Prime Minister of Canada? I don't think so, but I think there's a realistic chance it could be within the term of office of the next Prime Minister of Canada. And that's a, that's a target that I think has an aura of reality about it that I think we should I think, I think you know, the, the Washington State Ballot Initiative could totally change the yeah. landscape too here, right? Your average Canadian talks about, oh, the borders will get sealed if we ever did anything. Whereas, you know, if Canada doesn't change its laws, um, you know, we're going to be looking to the south at, uh, you know, a whole much safer regulated regime that, uh, that uh, will obviously become the envy of, of Canadians. So playing policy catch up. Yeah. Yeah. There is a lot of momentum gaining, and it's great, like I said, that we're having so many different types of allies come forward. But I should remind people that for the many decades prohibition has been in place, it has been a lot of grassroots activists who have been pushing this. And my husband, although he did violate the law by selling seeds, nobody was harmed in that exchange, and the money used was sent to activists and organizations throughout the United States to try and push towards this change. So now that we've reached this tipping point, we have to remember that there are many people who laid a lot of groundwork to get a lot of organizations and politicians on board in order to get to this point that we're seeing now. So I invite anybody to join this argument that prohibition is a failed policy, but to remember that even civil disobedience, when it's done peacefully and nonviolently, is an important step in changing any unjust laws. We know from many different historical examples that civil disobedience has been essential in repealing unjust laws and Mark with the money that he sent to Americans and the seeds that he sent to Americans so they could grow their own instead of buying from gangs, that his efforts, although illegal in the United States, uh, did have a lot of impact on laying the groundwork over the decades leading up to this point where we are today. I see there's a couple of uh, Stop the Violence Coalition members who have flown in from out of, time, out of town. So Dr. Kennedy, I see maybe this will be the last question. My question is for Professor McKay, uh, if I can see you there. Um, I understand that there's quite a strong venture capital market in the USA, just wondering if you get a hold of uh, the cannabis uh, marketing, advertising, distribution, etc. How strong are the uh, potential regulations that your state is bringing in uh, uh, towards the actual regulation that my concern is that free enterprise is not the place to go uh, for the marketing of, uh, of cannabis. So I think if you think of, of I-502, our, our proposed uh, regulation and taxation law in the state of Washington, as treating marijuana like alcohol, you'll get a picture of what our regulatory structure would look like. 
so anyone who's engaged in growing marijuana legally would, have, would be licensed to anyone responsible for transporting the marijuana to the marketplace would be regulated. Anyone selling it would be regulated. Just as we regulate those who manufacture and sell alcohol in the United States, and I believe it's true in Canada. So it is, it's highly regulated, but legal. And I, I, I do think as a law enforcement person, um, having individuals poised to come into the market, whether it's in venture capital, as you've indicated, or those who might otherwise uh, be thinking about businesses that might enter a, 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 a legal market, will help in enforcement. Because I do think that the vast number uh, of individuals who consume marijuana, whether Canadian or American, would prefer to do that legally. Courses will be in part dependent on price points. Those are all things that will have to be determined how much you, you regulate and, and most importantly how, how much you tax it. Um, we can uh, move legal enterprises into the, into the space currently occupied by the drug cartels. They're not going to go easily. And I don't want anyone to think that I am of the view that the moment you pass a regulation taxation scheme, the criminals are going to go away, the violent gangs and criminals. It's going to take many years to drive them out. But I would much rather build that around a legal enterprise where we recognize who the good guys are versus the bad guys. And the, our law enforcement on both sides of the border will have to be prepared, even in a, a, a legal environment, to kick the bad guys out and take the money away from them. So it will take venture capitalists, it will take businesses, but it will take people with payrolls, with real employees who pay taxes, um, who, are, who are citizens who aren't armed with guns and carrying uh, cocaine and meth and ecstasy in the other pocket. I think we should stop there. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, really appreciate you helping to, uh, to tell this story.